This is episode number 90, featuring artist Bob Rome. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. This podcast is brought to you by the FACE Conference, the second annual figurative art convention and expo, which spells FACE. One of the great ways for any artist to perfect their skills and learn the figurative painting. And if you're a plein air painter, learning figurative painting, as you're going to learn in this podcast, is something that's really important to you. Instructors, well, there's so many to mention. I'll mention a few. Uh, Daniel Sprick, an opportunity to see Daniel Sprick demo and to hear him speak, which is a very rare thing. So that's just worth it, that alone. But then, then you got David John Casson and Michelle Dunaway and Casey Baugh and Sadie Valari and Bert Silverman, Rose Franson, Graydon Parrish, Sabenhauer, the amazing sculptor doing the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C., uh, World War One Memorial, excuse me, and many more, and some to be announced yet. It's going to be held in November in Miami. Grab your seats. It's limited to 350 people, and we're already getting close to a sellout. The interview is also underwritten by Little at All Art Instruction Videos, delivering quality art video workshops for 30 years. Check out their amazing lineup of art instruction videos from some of the world's best painters. Details, lots of details on how to paint. You can learn more at Lily, L I L I, artvideo.com. That's lilyartvideo.com. Well, let's get right to our interview with artist Bob Rome. Well, I'm happy to have Bob Rome on with us today. Bob, uh, you're a legend, and I'm so honored to have you on the Plein Air podcast. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that's very flattering to hear. <laughs> well, my intent isn't to flatter, but to, you know, you, you have. Um, established such a wonderful career you've um you've you've been out there for a long time you've been painting and and doing books and now uh, recently doing videos and so you're um you're a superstar <laughs> well that's 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 nice to hear <laughs> and and modest so bob um for the people who might not be familiar with what it is you do uh just give a brief overview of um, how you would categorize yourself as a painter? Well, I'm a landscape painter, and I've been called an impressionist, but I don't relate myself to Monet and them. They, 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 they were they were very concerned with the blue and the warm and cool. Um, I'm more of a tonalist than that, but but I'm impressionistic in terms of my brushwork, um, trying not to render things out too exactly. Um, and create more of an uh, impression of what it is. So. I'm going to dig right into that, and, and we'll touch on some other things as we go. But w one of the things that a lot of, um, a lot of painters uh, hear when they're out painting is someone will come up there and they'll go, oh, you know, that looks just like a photograph, and yeah. think, thinking that that's a compliment. And yet also a lot of uh, younger or perhaps inexperienced painters the, some, sometimes their goal is to make it very much like a photograph. You talked about not rendering it too much. Touch on that. Let, let us understand that. Well, you're trying to, for me anyway, it's, it's, it's a matter of trying to c capture a feeling of the time and place and environment that you're in. Um, what does the atmosphere feel like? Uh, is the light really warm or cool? Um, what time of year is it? And uh, just get that overall sense of uh, of what, what's happening. So when you so. When, when you go out to a scene, uh, what's going through your head when you're trying to decide what you're going to paint? Well, the first thing I'm looking for is shapes and contrast. Um, even on a cloudy gray day, the thing that's going to make the painting work is contrast. 
So I try to find some area of dark and light um, that I can focus in on and then uh, use the other elements to uh, su support that. Um, even in a sunlit day with, uh, with a high degree of contrast, you're going to have uh, that high degree of contrast area be the center of interest. And of course, everything else has to relate to it. Uh, you don't want to create too many areas of too much contrast because they'll fight with one another. So um, it's difficult sometimes to edit a scene and make take take a, take a landscape with a big open vista and a large tree line and contrast and stuff. It's very important to focus in on one part of that tree line and emphasize that contrast there rather than making the whole line of the vista the same. So if, if that's not what you're seeing, let, let's say, for instance, that you've got a band of pine trees and um, you're looking at that band of pine trees and it basically kind of goes across the whole composition uh, and it's, it's basically straight, are you saying that you'll, you'll make part of it very contrasty and then the rest of it you'll fake it so that it's not quite as contrasty? Yes, and it might be very subtle, but it, but I will do that, um, and that's that's so that you create a a composition and focal point within the painting and make the make some part of the tree line different. Well, um, typically, the contrast is closer. The darker darks are closer than than distance. So, are you right. typically making your focal point something that's closer to the viewer? I'm normally making mine in the middle ground. If you think of foreground, middle ground, and background, yeah. um, I do know some painters who who emphasize the the background, um, the distance. Um, but I, I don't do that very often, and it's not necessarily the the blackest black and whitest white. It's the value contrast you get within an area. For example, I might have a a strong black up front, but if what it's next to is a dark gray, the contrast isn't too great. So if I have a middle value toward the distance, but it's, but it's next to a really light sky, that contrast is greater than the black that's up close to me. Okay, interesting. So yeah. when you're painting darks, um, and, and we'll use this analogy of trees again, pine trees, uh, you're looking out at the pine trees and you've got the pine trees maybe uh, in front of you, and then in the distance, you can see the pine trees on the mountain, uh, and then the far, far distance, you can see, you know, the tiny, tiny little pine trees on the mountain. Uh, obviously, yellow gets lost through atmosphere, so things are not nearly as yellow. They become more blue, but how do you create the right sense of values so that your darks still look dark, but not too washed out when you're putting them in the distance? Uh, the best way I can relate to that is that every every color I use from middle ground, uh, foreground, middle ground, background is modified a little bit with white paint so that it becomes duller and lighter uh, every layer that it goes back. Um, so do you make so things would, any bluer as they go back? Yeah, yeah, I will we'll often do that as well. But, but the, the key is graying them down a little bit and adding the white to them so that there's just this element of haze. Everything as it moves into the distance is trying to become a middle value gray. And there's very time, very few times you get to see it, but one time I was up in the mountains in New Mexico and I looked to the west and you saw the complete disappearance of the horizon. The sky went down low and became a light value of gray and the distance went so far out that it eventually got to a middle value, light value gray, and the sky and the ground merged. And you, you couldn't really see a horizon out there. Um, like I say, you don't see that often, but I have seen it. And, and do you ever uh, push it? Um, there's a painter out oh, yeah. in California who always pushes the distance much further than it appears to him. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I, I um, always... That's one of the things I, I was happy for when I learned to do it was to uh, create that separation between planes so that if you identify what is putting in your middle ground, if you create a definite separation between the middle ground and the background, 
um, whether you have to force it or not, um, it makes the painting much stronger. And so I, once I learned to do that, it made a huge, huge improvement in my paintings. Where did you learn um, these things? Well, I've taken a lot of workshops over the years. Um, <laughs> I don't know who I learned that one from. Um, yeah, it's hard. It's, it'd be hard to say. Um, I, I kind of picked up something from everybody I ever, ever worked with. And some of them, some of them come back to you years later. I know I, early on, I studied a lot with, uh, Albert Handel and, uh, he said things to me that didn't make any sense. And, you know, 10, 15 years later, I'm, I'm working, I'm like, oh, that's what he meant. And it's, it's funny how they, they just come back to you. Well, it's interesting because I discovered something that you do that I learned from Albert. Uh, after the plein air convention, I went over to Albert's studio and hung out for a little while. And he was, he was showing me how you can create some really powerful effects by changing the color, but keeping the value the same. And, and I think that Oh yeah, uh, that I saw you doing that as well. Um, you want to talk about that? Absolutely. I I think that's one of the uh, strongest part of parts of painting that uh, you have to separate the, uh, the 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 key values of the painting. And I try not to use more than like four of them, um, separating those to the shapes. And then within the shape, you just modify the colors that you see in there. For for example, I will go back to the tree line thing again. I used to tell students all the time, try and try to find the average of that tree line. And they're like, well, I see yellow, green, I see blue, I see red. It's like, okay, squint your eye and what is the average? And you might see like a blue green or a yellow green. And that's the average you paint that mass in as value and color wise. And so then as you paint, you try not to change the value too much, but you modify your color to bring some more blues and reds and yellows into it, but keep the value the same. And that way the tree line can take on the appearance of uh, warm sunlight, cool shadows and stuff, but it will, will hold its place within the value range of the painting. Now you talked very early on about big shapes. Um, it's one of the first things you mm -hmm. said is you're looking for, for uh, contrast in big shapes. And, right. Uh, um, uh, uh, a lot of painters, of course, talk about the importance of big shapes, and I want you to touch on that. But um, at what point do you lose that big shape? At what point do you go too far? Um, I don't think you ever do. You, If you modify that shape so much that you create um, variations of contrast, of value, that ends up breaking up that shape, then you no longer have a shape. That one shape, you have several shapes that you've created. So it's very important to modify it, but be careful not to change up the value too much or you you will lose it. Um, one major variation in that is is the video that we recently shot in which the I did, I did a series of aspen tree, tree trunks. I was very concerned with the shape of the overall background and flow of the painting. So I looked at the pattern of light in the leaves and the pattern of light and shadow that made across the background, and then also the shape of uh, dark that moved across the back. And so I was very concerned with getting that big shape working first, and then I concentrated on the rhythm of the trees and the pattern of the trees as they played against those shapes. So even in something that is a very busy pattern, it was still focused on the the design of the shapes first. So you did a book, um, I don't know how many years ago now, but you, you had published a book. Can you talk about um, some of the key principles that you taught in that book? Yeah, one of the main things that I believe in very strongly, even to this day, I mean, it's, it's the way I paint, is that you you see the separation of the shapes and the simple value arrangements. And after you work your way through the underpainting and you block in all those average colors and average values, you have to ex establish what I call the extremes. What is the lightest light, most intense color, sharpest edge, and darkest dark? 
and where do they appear? Um, and they will really define the painting. And so your center of interest may not just be black and white. It may be the sharpest edge. Um, it may be the most intense color, or your most intense color may not even be um, near the center of interest. It may be defined by two of the elements, but not more than that. Um, but anyway, anyway, I try to get all of that underpainting done and establish as extremes. And then basically the painting is done because you've established a value pattern, established a color harmony, uh, a color, color pattern to it, and you have a center of interest. So really the painting is done. All, all that's left is for you as the artist to decorate it with the amount of detail that you want to put in, whether it's photorealism or, or very abstract. It's, it's totally up to you. But that, that is the approach I use, and that's why the underpainting is so important to me. And then once that's accomplished, um, it's all a matter of refining shapes and, and adding color variations and so forth to it. And, and as I said before, you try not to break up a shape with too many value changes or too many color changes that you end up creating, creating more shapes and becoming busy, uh, busier than what you established. Now, I think you told me, I may be remembering this wrong, but I think you told me that you're, you're not teaching workshops anymore. Is that correct? I may teach one from time to time, but I don't do a lot of them. Yeah, so yeah, you, one, of the most, uh, one of the most popular questions on the podcast that I get from people is that um, they're, they're always looking for, uh, if, if they're beginners, they're always looking for what is it that all the beginners tend to do, um, make mistakes about or do wrong. Maybe there's not a right or wrong, but the, the things that, that you found over the years that, that confuse beginners or make it difficult for them when they're going outdoors to paint, um, what, what would your response to that be? They're trying to use too many colors, and they're trying not to learn to mix what they see. They uh, they try to buy every tube of green they can find, and yeah, but that's uh, fun. <laughs> it may, I mean, yeah, it is fun to go shopping for all that stuff, but uh, it can really weaken your painting. For example, you can you can you can do a painting with uh, some nice warm tones in it, and suddenly you throw in a green, and it has absolutely no relationship to any of the other colors you use and looks totally foreign. And that's true of purples and reds and all kinds of things. But uh, So I, I personally work with a very limited palette these days. How many colors on uh, your palette? I have about four on my palette. Okay, so uh, you're, not even, you're not even doing a cool and a warm version of each color. So you're, you're basically doing right. a, a, is it, what, well, what, tell us what your palette is. It's uh, ultramarine blue, alizarin, um, then I either use a cad red light or an orange, yellow, and then white, and then what I consider now to be my most important color, it's a neutral middle value gray. Oh, um, I remember you telling me that. As a matter of fact, I went out and I bought a tube of that stuff, ah. um, and I haven't tried it yet, but um, I think it, you, can, you can mention the brand if you want to. Well, the brand that I prefer is Williamsburg because their middle value gray is a neutral, a very neutral, whereas the uh, Portland gray made by Gamblin, which I also really like and use a lot, is very cool. So when you go to add it to mixtures, um, it will alter the mixture in a cool fashion, whereas the uh, Williamsburg version doesn't do that. So it's, help, it's, help me understand what it is you're doing. You're, uh, where, where are you putting this gray, and how are you using it? Well, first, there's a couple of things that it's, it's doing for me. It's keeping me, what I say, is honest in terms of uh, if I look at a scene, and depending on what light is on my canvas or whatever, I may get the values all out of whack. And if I have that middle value gray on the palette, I can put that up there, or lay that down and say, okay, that is actually a middle value. And that's where I need to adjust things to fit, either darker or lighter or whatever. Um, well, and then I also... You can do that with a, with a gray card, though, too, right? 
Yeah, but I think it's a little harder. Um, it's much easier to do uh, with a gray on your palette and, and when you're mixing your colors and so forth, uh, rather than laying a card up to compare compare notes to. Yeah, now, but you're um, also mixing that into your colors. I am. I use it uh, extensively. It's I use it kind of as a complement. Um, if, like if I'm going to take blue and you would automatically just add orange to it, um, I will modify the orange to get the value I want first and then add that to the blue. And so I will end up with a gray-blue modified with uh, the orange-gray right away. Or maybe I want to go the other way. Maybe I want to take the orange and tone it down, and I'm going to add blue to my gray, and it just brings me right into the value range that I need with the color temperature uh, right away. Now, it doesn't work if you're trying to stay very intense and very uh, brilliant with the color, but color is typically not that intense anyway. It's usually always toned down. Part of the problem beginners make is that they, they don't gray down their color enough. Oh. Well, One of the you, old... you and I were talking about how um, I, I think that we both kind of went through that at early stages of our careers where, uh, you know, we we would make our colors too bright or too garish or too, maybe bright isn't the right word because you want the values, right? But, but, yeah. but, you know, the classic problem in a painting are greens, right? The, the right. acidic, bright greens, which oftentimes are exactly what you're seeing or you feel like you're seeing, but they don't necessarily make the painting feel all that pleasing. Right. So, so we, I, I think you and I had talked about how we find that most good paintings, if you, if you look through historical paintings and you look through really great paintings that have this sense of elegance, most of them are pretty gray. Exactly. And they're, what, they're, what they do is that they really harmonize with the color that's there. And so that's more my emphasis these days is making sure the colors that I'm using are harmonizing together rather than trying to exactly match what I'm seeing in the landscape. For, um, so if I, if I see a chartreuse screen in the landscape, it's going to really mess up the painting if I put that in next to all the other color. But I can mix a very vivid green that creates the same effect but still harmonizes with what I've done. And I think that is one of the most important things beginners need to learn is to make the painting harmonize and don't try to copy exactly the colors that you're seeing out there. Well, that's a, that's easier said than done. <laughs> right. Well, it's taking a long time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, I, 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 find, I find that I'm still tempted by it. it. I just, you know, I see I was out oh, there absolutely. Day, I was painting this this field it was a almost bright yellow green field against a blue mountain in the background and and i was just like ah i got to get that intensity but when i when i laid it down it just didn't feel very good to me it just didn't feel, well see it that's didn't part feel rich or elegant that's part of the benefit of the limited palette you can't you can't do it <laughs> so you have to create a relationship there rather than Putting that kind of screaming color in there, so what, which would what was which the, would, would not harmony. Uh, har what harmony. was the yellow you said you were using on your limited palette? Because I'm not sure you said. Uh, I'm I'm using cad yellow light. Cad yellow light. Okay. Yeah. All right. The uh, the lemon is too green for me, and the uh, yellow medium and deep get just a little bit uh, too rich and too orange. So uh, just the Nice cad yellow light is uh, really, really nice and clean. You know, one Be of careful. The that, one of the things about a limited palette is that you can almost not get out of harmony. Right. Every, everything is in harmony. Uh, when I first learned to paint, it was limited palette, and everything was harmonious, and then I got seduced by all these colors, which I still do. I, I have a lot more colors on my palette than you do. Oh, we and, all do. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and, you know, every time I think I've stabilized on my palette, I find some new color that somebody's got, and I go, oh, I have right. to have that. And then, of course, I play with but, it, and sometimes it sticks, and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, I've got drawers full of colors, <laughs> various colors I've tried. Maybe you'll have to have a garage yeah. sale. I know. <laughs> so, uh, Bob, uh, how many years have you been painting? 
Well, off and on my whole life, which is a long time, um, I started as a kid, a teenager, uh, went to art school, but then I got sidetracked into the uh, video production business, and then eventually I got back into painting and then, and then worked my way into painting full time. So it, it's been it's been a long time. I'd say I'd say I've been full time for about 30 years. Yeah. So, so what happens when you've painted that long? What happens to your the way you see? What happens to your sensibilities of paint as a painter? How do you think that you've changed uh, over the years? Well, boy, that's tough. We just we do definitely keep evolving. Um, I think thirty years ago I would have never considered the limited palette that I'm working with now. I would have been scared to death of not having the the brilliant colors that I need uh, to match a scene. But you know, so I've gotten away from that. Um, my understanding of using value has changed dramatically over the years. I thought I always, I always, well, I always thought I, and did understand value, but I didn't understand how value related to the warm and cool color in the painting. And that just keeps becoming a more and more uh, sophisticated thing that, uh, that we look for a more subtle thing that we, we appreciate within our painting and other paintings. Can you touch on that a little bit more? Because I want to understand that in, in a little bit more depth. How does value relate to warm and cool? Well, the value, the, the way I can, best way I can describe that is you might have a light colored field of uh, uh, dead corn stalks as an example. And yet you have a blue sky that's fairly light and washed out. They are both the same value but one is blue and one is is a warm yellow ochreish kind of color. So you have to make sure that you get those values working, but interpret them as warm or cool. And then you can add shadows into the corn stalks and um, you know furrows in the field and all that kind of stuff. But don't change up the value too dramatically, or you will create too much contrast in there. Rely more on color temperature changes. Uh, Mary Cassatt, the way she painted portraits is a great example of it. She would show the softness of a child by not changing value hardly at all, like in the child's arm or face as it moved from sunlight to shadow. She would change color temperature from the wonderful warm and light to the cool blues and grays of, of the shadows. And, but if you photograph it in black and white, it almost looks flat, almost looks like the same thing. So they really depend heavily on color temperature, even though the value is the same. Now, will you import um, some of those yellows in that cornfield into the sky and vice versa? I will, yeah, as long as the overall mass continues to read um, either warm or cool. But yeah, I, I I don't ever put a a blue sky in and leave it all cold without bringing in some of the colors from the land and and vice versa. Um, you definitely have to bring the sky down down into the landscape as well. And particularly okay. particularly in cast shadows. Right. Yeah. Right. And and then in terms of some of the other things that you may have realized about yourself after thirty years of painting, anything else that stands out? Um, I don't have long enough to keep learning what I need to know. Um, I'm I'm only now beginning to understand what I'm doing, and uh, you know, it's it's like I don't have I don't have another thirty forty years to uh, to keep learning it. <laughs> well, you're not going to have it if you if you keep that mindset. Stop well, it. that's true, but you you know <laughs> what I mean. It's, <laughs> it's just like uh, you you never. You, you think that you think that someday you have it all figured out, and it's been my experience that you never do. You just you just keep evolving and changing, and I, I think that's the beauty of painting, is that uh, it's always it's always a challenge. If it, I think if it ever becomes just mundane repetition, that you're you're in trouble. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so will you go and study with other people from time to time to uh, just kind of stay on top I, of if they have something you want to learn? I haven't, but I would. Um, it, I wouldn't hesitate. I, I would very be very careful to not study with somebody who's going to mess up what I'm doing. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, if somebody is a drawler, for example, rather than painting shapes, I'm not going to go study with them because I don't want to work with somebody that uh, is focused on a different approach to, to doing things than what I do. I see. Um, somebody may be too realistic or too abstract for what I'm doing. Um, you know, that, that can be an issue. They, they may use a different tool. Um, like I know, to mention a couple of names, uh, Matt Smith and uh, Albert Handel used a palette knife very extensively to create really crisp, clean edges. And I've found over the years that when I try that, it becomes hard for me to make it unify within the painting, whereas for them it's perfect. Um, you know, nobody can argue with their their accomplishment, but, but, but I have to be careful about what I would incorporate from other people. So that's why one caution for people is to, make sure that they study with people whose work they like and admire. And then when they learn what they're doing, they can either decide it's important to them to incorporate that or not. And that, uh, cause then they know what makes their paintings work and what, what doesn't. So, uh, for me, I've known, I've, I've determined what I want to keep and what I want to let go. So, so the, um, I always ask the question about beginners and some of the, the, the recommendations for beginners, but I also want to talk about people who are kind of at an intermediate level. Um, somebody recently at an event said to me, you know, you're always asking that question about what would you do if you're a beginner, but what, you know, what do you recommend for somebody who's been painting a little while, but they, they just kind of feel like they're stuck and they're not growing what what have you done when you've got stuck and you're not growing? Well, I actually went through a period like that for about three years, and uh, I kind of hid it from everybody that I was that I was going through it. But uh, I ended up taking a workshop, which was totally unrelated to what I do. It was it was a uh, a figure painting portrait workshop, but the instructor, she just made me realize I was what I was not doing and the way I was not looking and seeing. So that worked for me, but I'm not sure how to tell other people that because you, know, you could end up taking a half dozen workshops and none of them work for you. Well, I think, the, I think the answer, though, to what you said, I think the magic to what you said is to get out of your comfort zone. You know, I right. think I think we we all get kind of very comfortable with what we're doing, and and when you go from landscape painting to portrait or figure painting, you're using it. You're you're using different skills. You're using different parts of your brain. It's not something that you can do in your sleep like you can do with landscapes, and so it really challenges you. And so and and by the way, somebody told me I think it was I think it was Daniel Graves from the Florence Academy. He said, Eric, if you want to be a really good landscape painter, learn to paint portraits. And I, it was like, <laughs> what? And, yeah. And so when he said that, and that's been probably eight, nine years, eight, eight years ago, I think. And so I started a portrait group at my house. And every week on Wednesday nights, uh, I paint portraits. Good. And I try to do it whenever I'm around. And so it, and it, somehow it actually has made me better universally. So I think the same thing applies to you. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you because uh, when I lived in a different area there, uh, we had a Friday night figure painting group. And, um, every, you know, every week we we went in there and, and painted figures. And so for a landscape painter to do that was quite different. Uh, most of the people in there were figure painters and portrait painters, but uh, it, was, it was really interesting. I, I think it helped me a lot. Yeah, I think you've got to get out of your comfort zone, and and sometimes it's just a matter of, of uh, you know, moving into something different. You know, if you're, it could be still life, it could be portraits or or figures or, 
or other things. And, and, and I think also workshops are fabulous because it's a great way to find out what somebody else knows. And, yeah. Uh, I don't think I can say it correctly, but what uh, what I was told basically in essence was you're, you're drawing too much, you're relying on the control of the drawing too much, and then you're tending to, to be restricted by that. And she said, you drew it once, you can draw it again. Just, you know, put, put the edges, put, put the paint on there. Slide the things around and, you know, find the right color and value. You know, if you want to find that edge again, you can find it. You can do it. And uh, that made a huge difference. That, that changed my, my life right then. Well, you know, that all also kind of equates to the idea of not falling in love with what you're doing. Right. Right. So, you know, be willing to scrape, be willing to repaint, be willing to, uh, you know, if your drawing is off, if your if the feel is off, be willing to change it. Don't, yeah. you know, don't get stuck and, and just stay in the same place. Absolutely. Yeah. So who were the inspirations for you uh, as a painter? Who still inspires you? And what is it about those painters that really gets you excited well the the my my first inspiration was monet um and of course i was attracted to the impressionist most of all and uh then i got into the books published by emil Gruppi, and uh, he was a new england painter um you know 40 50 years ago but uh, he i really got into his work a lot he was very loose and and bold, and the way he painted was, uh, he, he said John F. Carlson told him he wrote his canvases, he didn't paint them, meaning that he used to use very direct brushwork to describe forms and shapes and and objects. And uh, anyway, I, I really got into that a lot. And since then, um, the two of the ones that really stick out to me are uh, Matt Smith and Albert Handel. Um, in both cases, I just I love the subtlety of the forms that they use and the softness of the edges. Um, with Albert, like you said, the, the getting the color variations within the shape. Um, both of them, I just I just love their work. Um, even though I find that it doesn't work for me, like like I was mentioning with the palette knife, um, I can't I can't do that. Uh, Matt, Matt ends up being looking very realistic in many senses, and uh, I, I, can't, I can't do that. But I, I, I love the way that he handles the, the simplicity of the shapes and the uh, subtle variations between them. So. And what do you think you learned from from Group A? Um, was there was there something very specific that that really stood out to you in his books? Uh, more than anything else, I'd have to say it was the simplicity of not getting caught up in all the details and not spending the time to to sweat all the little stuff and th concentrate on what's important, uh, which you have to do when you go outside and paint. You have to uh, you have to very quickly analyze what makes the scene work and what's important and and what is unimportant, and and you also have to consider, of course, what's changing. Uh, what's what's changing fast and get that down and things that you can work on later uh, let let that go but anyway I got I got the directness from Groupie that uh, that I think he does mm -hmm. so well how much plein air painting do you do you've been in the studio a long time do you still go outside I still go outside and I, I do a lot of plein air painting I become a little bit more sensitive to the weather, meaning that when it gets really hot, I stay inside much sooner than I used to. <laughs> um, well, you live outside same, of Austin, Texas. It's very understandable. You would melt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, I used to go out you, and paint all summer long, but uh, I, don't, I don't do that too much anymore. Uh, so. When you go outside, uh, do you paint small? Do you paint large? Yeah, size has become a big issue. To, well, I realized it was a big issue for me, and I realized a long time ago through the workshops that students had a big problem with the size. They 
needed to, what they needed to realize and learn was what size was best for them, just like with myself. Um, if you work on paintings that are really small, like 6x8 and 8x10, and you're not comfortable with that, you feel like you're scrunched up and picking and nitpicking at things, and it makes you uncomfortable to work on it size-wise. By the same token, if you work on a 1620, 1824, and you feel like you can't get the canvas covered, then you need to downsize uh, from that. So you need to try and find that happy medium. And for me, I've found that I'm really comfortable anywhere from 11 by 14 to 16 by 20. Working small and I feel constrained and working larger than that, and I feel like I have to work too hard to get the canvas covered in the short amount of time available. Whereas for other people, they're very comfortable painting 8 by 10s and 9 by 12s and that uh, working on a 14, 18 would just be a nightmare for them. Um, some people like really large canvases. But but I, really, I think it's really important to you as the artist and to your comfort level as a painter to find out what size range you're comfortable working in. You and take, then stick to that. Are you taking your canvases then, the studies uh, that you're doing plein air, and turning them into bigger bigger pieces for galleries? Or are you, um, are you Sometimes. Painting? And sometimes yeah, you're just sometimes. taking those in, in, and putting them into the galleries. Yeah, a little bit of everything. I I never put the uh, pressure on myself to do a gallery painting outside, but if it happens, great. Um, whereas indoors, I expect I expect everything to be a gallery ready piece, um, so the pressure is there. Um, what I do a lot of times is I will work on location on a piece, and I'll take a lot of photographs. And then from those combined elements, I will do a painting of, of a scene or, or of a location. But it won't necessarily be um, an enlargement of the plein air piece. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I do that, but, but usually, usually I'm really, really modifying it. But I, however, I do feel that you can't really appreciate a, an area, a scene, unless you have painted plein air there. Uh, makes all the difference in the world. Uh, I, do, I've do, I do a lot of aspen tree paintings, and I, I've painted an awful lot in the aspen trees different times of the year, uh, summer, fall, winter. Um, and it, it, it makes a huge difference in how I perceive the colors and the environment and the smells and just the feeling of, of the scene. So I don't think I could effectively do that had I not been there. And the same with uh, with with mountains and so forth. There's, you know, you you have to make that trip through the Rocky Mountain National Park and paint there for a week before you go home and try and paint from photographs of it. Um, you just you won't capture the feeling of it. So if if you, if you're out on a trip and you've not done a study and you take a photograph of something that you think would make a good painting, will you not do it if you haven't painted there? It's it's pretty it's pretty unusual. Yeah, I, I normally won't. If I haven't painted in a very similar location, I, I typically won't do it. So. Well, I'm not. You're not the only one. I think that I've found that um, uh, I've gotten to the point where. I only paint for my studies. I can't paint from a photograph at all. I look at the photograph oh, okay. for, you know, to, to see how the shape of a tree is or something that I might have gotten wrong. But right. um, I, I don't feel like I can get the, the feel of light. Yeah. See, I love Photoshop. I, I, I can sit here on my desk and cut and paste trees and move things around and <laughs> take mountains from one scene and put them in another scene. And, but you have yeah. to have painted those elements in person for them to be in your paintings. Right. I have to have to, I have to have painted in that environment to be able to use elements from that environment in a painting. You haven't talked much about composition. You talked a little bit about uh, point of interest. Do you have any particular thoughts on composition? Um, do good ones. <laughs> the uh, I, I like the I I, I just uh, there for a while. I studied the whole uh, 
thing as a concentric uh, nautilus shell and uh, the golden rule and golden mean and all that. But anyway, I, I just went beyond all that. I mean, it was it was fun to learn it and study it, but uh, I basically just use the the rule of thirds um, when I'm doing a canvas, and then I locate the uh, center of interest near one of those intersecting points. So you're talking uh, about basically the tic-tac-toe board where you divide the canvas in thirds both directions and then where the points intersect. Yeah. Yeah. And and sometimes if I'm concerned about it, I will, uh, I will literally draw a line through the vertical center of the painting or the horizontal center just to make sure I don't put a dominant edge or line um, near that that I, that I think might happen with the scene that I'm thinking about doing. Makes uh, a lot of sense. Well, Bob, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a fascinating interview. We didn't talk much about your history or um, your, you know, your upbringing or anything, but your, your knowledge of painting is so fascinating. It, we, just, we just focused on that, and I think that's what people are really interested in. That's, that's really good well, thanks. stuff. thanks. I, I appreciate that. I, uh, I think teaching for years uh, helped that a lot. The, uh, you have to you have to verbalize what it is that you're understanding and doing, and learning learning to ver verbalize that I think makes you think about what the concepts are behind it. Yeah, so. well, teaching is is one of the best ways to learn. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time today, and thank you for uh, inspiring us. Your paintings are beautiful. I'm anxious to see this video and. Uh, your book is phenomenal. I have it. I think it's out of print, but what's the name of it in case people... Uh, the Painterly Approach. Uh, you can still find copies on uh, Amazon and eBay, of course. Uh, so it's it's readily available still. All right. Outstanding. Well, Bob, thank you so much, and um, sayonara. Same to you. Thank you. <laughs> okay.